The success of all these initiatives depends upon the regular supply of energy. Traditionally, the people of Bhutan have used wood and kerosene as fuel. However, with the modernization of their homes, electricity is increasingly becoming a necessity. And His Majesty has responded with a massive rural electrification program thanks to which even homes in remote areas are enjoying the benefits of electrical appliances. Most of Bhutan's electricity is generated at hydroelectric power stations such as the Chuka Hydropower Project. Well over a decade ago, His Majesty realized that the country's swift flowing waters could provide low cost energy for the people. In fact, the Chuka Hydropower Project was the first such scheme of its kind in the country. And once it was launched, it generated an incredible surplus of electricity. The king personally negotiated the sale of power to India, and today, the revenue it brings in accounts for nearly one-third of all government earnings. And by the turn of the century, the Kurichu and Thala hydropower projects with a combined capacity of 1,080 megawatts will be in operation. Besides the big hydro projects, a number of micro hydels, such as this Getsa Hydel in Bumtang, have also been commissioned. These are better placed to distribute electricity to the local communities and form part of an extensive plan for rural electrification. A major benefit of hydro projects is that they can control the overall flow of water and make more of it available during the dry season. While developments in energy, industry and communication have improved beyond imagination the lives of ordinary people in Bhutan, their inspiration and their values remain firmly embedded in their Buddhist past. Even today, Bhutan is a land of deep spirituality and reverence for the Buddha and his teachings underlies all cultural activities. The arts, for example, give expression to religious themes and motives. Paintings, be they on statues, on walls, or on banners known as thangkas, usually personify holy figures, and painting them is considered an act of piety. Bhutan's varied musical forms are also dominated by a religious undercurrent. Some were explicitly developed to give rhythm to religious ceremonies and to punctuate the singing or recitation of texts. Even folk music which often allows for greater improvisation, has a religious base. His Majesty is himself of the deepest religious conviction, and his instinct as the nation's leader is to protect and nurture this vital source of Bhutan's culture. That is why, in 1984, he established a nine-member council for ecclesiastical affairs 
the Datsang Hensok to meet the needs of the central monk body and to consolidate the various religious institutions in the country. His Majesty has also spearheaded a plan to renovate the nation's zongs and religious buildings. All these achievements have not only advanced Buddhist studies in the country, but have also enabled the monk body to take up social causes based on their religious philosophy. In Bhutan, the national dress is still the most common attire and is worn with a great sense of pride. And in keeping with the country's traditional code of conduct, known as Diglamnamsha, children are raised to be respectful and courteous to their elders. The preservation of its cultural heritage does not imply that Bhutan intends to remain static or isolated. But improvements in material conditions and its opening to the outside world must not erode the values which have for so long guided its people. His Majesty's own frugal lifestyle, the simplicity of his home, all attest to his firmest belief that material wealth should not dominate one's life and that human presence must always serve a higher purpose. Even his office, where dignitaries from around the world are welcomed, typifies his modest and down-to-earth nature. His sacrifice and his humility are unique and his hopes are that similarly, his people will not abandon time-tested values for alien lifestyles. It was for this reason that in 1985 he created the Special Commission for Cultural Affairs, a body which promotes and preserves Bhutan's distinct traditions and values as expressed in the customs, manners, language, dress, arts and crafts of its people. Over the years, the Special Commission has performed very valuable service to the nation. Through the National Library, it has stored a number of important texts, including scripts written in gold. Many rare documents have also been stored on microfilm. Through the School of Arts and Crafts, it has given assistance and opportunities to artisans to develop and display their skills. These crafts are important because they represent life as it was and still is in traditional Bhutanese households. And through the Academy of Performing Arts, young men and women are trained in the traditional folk and mask dances of their ancestors. They then perform at special ceremonies and religious festivals such as this one, not only to entertain visitors, but also to renew pride 
and a sense of belonging among local people. Indeed, inculcating this sense of pride in being Bhutanese is central to His Majesty's ultimate aim of devolving powers to the people. For a people with pride in what they have inherited from the past can look to the future with confidence and will be able to shoulder the responsibilities for their own welfare. With China beyond the mountains and India in the plains below, Bhutan has always endeavored to place its sovereignty above everything else. Over the last 25 years, all the projects and programs which have been implemented by His Majesty have therefore aimed not only at improving the living standards of the people, but also of securing sustainability and self-sufficiency. But in the modern world, self-sufficiency is meaningless if the people expect their government and ultimately one individual, their king, to be fully responsible for their welfare. Indeed, His Majesty had expressed this concern in his coronation speech itself. As far as you, my people, are concerned, you should not adopt the attitude that whatever is required to be done for your welfare will be done entirely by the government. On the contrary, a little effort on the part of the people will be much more effective than a great deal of effort on the part of the government. As soon as he assumed the throne, the king charted out a plan to decentralize authority and to increase people's participation in their own governance. His objectives were guided not by lofty ideals, but by some very pragmatic considerations. For example, even with an expanding network of roads and improved telecommunication systems, Many parts of the country are still difficult to reach and are often inaccessible during the winter and monsoon periods. A centralized administration is clearly impractical in such cases. In 1976, starting with the fourth five-year plan, the king began to realize his dream of devolving administrative authority. He instituted planning committees at both the district and village levels to encourage people's participation in the management of their own welfare. His purpose was to give a voice to local needs, as well as to pave the way for a decision-making process at the grassroots level. As these programs began to meet with success, His Majesty stunned the country with his most ambitious and far-reaching proposal yet. For on Monday, the 29th of June, 1998, a historic edict proposing far-reaching changes and devolution of full executive powers from the throne to the elected cabinet was read out to the members of the National Assembly during its 76th session. His Majesty propounded three fundamental changes in Bhutan's system of governance. Namely, that all cabinet ministers should henceforth be elected by the National Assembly. That the Assembly should decide on the role and responsibilities of the cabinet. And that the National Assembly should adopt a mechanism to move a vote of confidence in His Majesty. In effect, the king devolved his own executive powers to the people through their elected representatives. While he is to remain the head of state, he will no longer head the government, which is responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the country. This is truly a unique act in the history of humankind, for never before has a hereditary ruler ever taken the initiative of conceding his own political authority to others. In doing so, 
he has truly lived up to the prophecy of his greatness. On the day he handed over governance to the elected cabinet, he had this to say. This is a special day for me. I truly believe that the new policies and changes will benefit the nation and the people. I am happy because I know that what I have done is in the best interest of my country and my people. I have no doubt that you will serve the nation to the best of your ability. The <laughs> For many of its citizens, the past three decades have been the country's golden years. For in keeping with His Majesty's belief that cross-national happiness is more important than cross-national product, Bhutan has progressed well beyond expectations. Now, as the reins of their destiny are handed over to them, they must remember that this is part of a royal vision that was presented to them over 25 years ago. And it is a vision that looks far into the future. The king has placed his entire faith in his people. It is now for the people to live up to it with hope and with confidence. <laughs>